Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Very glad you could all join us uh, here today. I am Eli Leland, CTO and co-founder of Voltaic, and I'd like to welcome you to the next installment of our webinar series on battery manufacturing titled The Battery Manufacturing Chronicles, Gigafactory Veterans Share Their Stories. Uh, first, uh, start with some housekeeping notes. We welcome and encourage participation from our audience today, so please submit your questions through the Q&A function of your Zoom app. And please note that participant chat is disabled for this webinar. You know, we won't see your chats, uh, but please do use that Q&A function to submit your questions and we will see them and, um, and we'll have a Q&A uh, session uh, toward the end of our hour. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. <clears throat> so at Voltaic, uh, batteries are in our blood and uh, we are fortunate to have multiple Gigafactory veterans on our team. And today's panel features two of them. Um, Tony Tai is a senior battery engineer at Voltaic. Before joining Voltaic, Tony spent over a decade in the battery industry, including standing up new production facility with lithium battery, uh, working as a battery engineer at Panasonic Energy North America, and developing new battery products at K2 Energy Solutions, and also introducing Will Kemp. Will Kemp is a uh, platform data quality engineer at Voltaic. Uh, before joining Voltaic, Will spent nearly four years as a quality <clears throat> engineer and manager at the Gigafactory with prior roles in manufacturing engineering for electronics equipment and industrial engineering for consumer products. And we are also joined today uh, by my co-founder and Voltaic CEO, Tal Schulklopper, um, who's been on this journey with me for over a decade as we worked across the entire battery sector. Uh, and so we're gonna begin today's session with a brief presentation from Tony uh, to help frame the rest of the discussion. So Tony, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Eli. Uh, let me share my screen real fast. So I just want to do some table setting because I think everyone coming into the webinar uh, likely has you know, different ideas of what manufacturing is and isn't. So this is just to get everyone on the same page. So first thing I want to do is go over what the goal of a battery gigafactory is. Uh, it's pretty obvious. It's to make money. And... This is done by doing two things. It's done by building and selling batteries. And to make more revenue, a more profit, you either have to make uh, more battery sales or you have to lower your battery production costs. And I know this seems very obvious, uh, but it's gonna be really relevant. So commonly the way that you do this by building batteries faster or building them cheaper is to build it faster, cheaper, and not get sued. Now there's, to put these concepts into practice, uh, there's some common ways of doing each of these. So to build battery fa faster, you want to increase your throughput. And in practical terms, this means better processes, having more uptime and less downtime, better maintenance, and recognizing uh, patterns and uh, you know, forecasts. On the building batteries cheaper side, you want to reduce your costs. And this takes the form of higher yields, uh, reduced waste, cheaper materials, and a superior supply chain. And in terms of compliance and litigation, you want to catch anomalies, predict hazards, prevent fires, and, you know, better traceability. So, so the reason I bring up these goals is because it really underpins everything else we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so keep these in the back of your mind as you know, we have our discussion. So the next thing to keep in mind is that a Gigafactory is actually three factories. It's electrode, assembly, and formation and Q&A. Uh, so I live next door to a chocolate factory. This factory takes in, you know, cocoa and sugar and out comes chocolate, and nice and simple. Unfortunately, a battery gigafactory is way different from a chocolate factory. You basically have a bunch of intermediate products. And why this is relevant is, let's say you have a problem that's caused here in calendaring in the electrode process, but it doesn't get caught until formation in grading and inspection. So it goes through this process and then this process and then this process before it's finally caught. So whose problem is it? And that's actually a very tough question uh, to answer. 
Okay, next thing to keep in mind, this is what most folks think of when they think of manufacturing. I guarantee you, if you open up a MBA textbook, you're gonna find some variation of this chart. So essentially, uh, you have a bunch of capital. It's mysteriously allocated into equipment, materials, labor, and knowledge. It goes through a production process that turns uh, those inputs into goods, then turn into revenue. And this is the simple uh, conceptualization of it. What we find in practice is it's actually not simple at all. So this is all the uh, more surrounding, complicated uh, departments, groups, teams that all have a hand in making sure that uh, the right teams come together to supply the right equipment, the right material, the right labor, and the right know-how. Actually, way harder than it sounds. So all of these teams can be roughly grouped into uh, four categories. So if I group these by color, they are, roughly speaking, uh, the four pillars of manufacturing. And everyone has these, whether formally or informally. So in red is supply chain, which is a grouping of roles that involves finding, getting, and moving material to where it needs to be. In green is quality, which is a grouping of roles that involves ensuring that material, product, and processes are meeting spec and regulations. In blue is engineering, which is a group of roles that involves fixing problems before they occur, when they occur, and after they occur. And lastly, in gray is production, which is a grouping of roles that involves operating the day-to-day -day business of turning these four key inputs, uh, equipment, material, labor, know-how, into revenue. And again, it's important to note that these are logical groupings for organizational purposes for the sake of discussion. At larger manufacturers, each of these roles is typically their own department. And you know, additionally, there's more roles. There's sales, marketing, customer service that are out of scope. Okay, so let's examine these four pillars a little more. If I condense all of those roles into the four groups, you can think of it by their phrase. So for supply chain, you know, obviously it's getting materials. For quality, it's making it meet spec. Engineering fixes the problems and production makes it fast and cheap. And just uh, to point out where in the product life cycle this is, this is the really thin slice of manufacturing that occurs at the very end of the product life cycle. And this is a very important slice because it is by far the largest and uh, you know, the rest of this, uh, colloquially known as R&D, only has an investment of about 1.25% of the entire budget in U.S. manufacturing. Uh, the vast majority of the budget goes to manufacturing, which is you know, the day-to-day -day operation of the manufacturing sites. Okay, so I went over all that because it's important to note that each of these pillars has a different and competing perspective on how to solve issues. So here's a typical response from each team when you're asked a very common process improvement question, which is how do we increase our uptime? So each of these pillars have what I would describe as a classic frenemy relationship between say production and quality. So even though these two groups have the same goals in common, uh, they have competing perspectives on how they should get there. So for example, production would tell you, we can increase our uptime by doing less maintenance and running longer. Quality would tell you, uh, we should do more maintenance to prevent downtime. And which of these perspectives is correct? Uh, there's not an automatic right or wrong answer. Each of these, uh, could have scenarios where each solution is valid. And this is where uh, manufacturing gets really fun and very dramatic. So here are some other common questions. How do you rec reduce costs? Well, production would tell you, you can produce as many cells as possible, or you can only produce only from good material. And again, there are certain situations where each of these is valid. And probably my favorite, uh, question, 
how should we lower the defects? This is a classic uh, pointing fingers at each other kind of response. So production will tell you, you should get more QC. Quality will tell you, uh, production needs more training. So uh, yeah, just wanted to frame the discussion we're gonna have today. And let me pass it back over to Eli. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Tony, for that introduction. Uh, it helps set the table. And uh, it was really interesting in preparing for this webinar and hinted at in the introduction when I introduced uh, you, know, you and Will and, and also in your slides, that sort of <clears throat> duality of the production team and the quality team and you know, both you know, ostensibly aligned toward a goal, but, but having a relationship that can be um, somewhat at odds uh, in practice at times. So, um, yeah, I'd love to uh, just get a little bit more into what each of you, uh, what each each of you did, and your and your roles. So, uh, Tony, perhaps uh, let's start with you. Can you just tell me a bit about what your role was uh, as you worked at the Gig Factory? Well, I worked at multiple. Uh, so, I started out as testing Q and A test engineer. Uh, then I became a manufacturing engineer. Uh, worked on several processes in winding and assembly. Uh, and eventually I became a production manager. So I started in engineering, uh, moved over to production and yeah. Excellent. Thanks. And, uh, Will, uh, please uh, tell us what your role was. Um, so yeah, my time in, uh, battery manufacturing, um, I was in, in the quality control department. Um, we had very hard line between what was quality assurance and quality control at my time. Um, and we were split up by process. So um, I started as a quality control engineer in formation and visual inspection and shipping. Um, we got the whole end of the process, seeing it all the way go to the customer. Um, and then uh, at my time there, I was able to um, get promoted a couple times. And by the end of my tenure, I was quality control manager of the formation quality department. Um, I also had testing and process cleanliness, which contribute to a lot of the issues that we saw. Um, but yes, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was a great learning experience. Awesome. And um, you just uh, you know, you, you just mentioned that there was a hard line between QA and QC, perhaps for uh, those who aren't quite as deep in this. Can you uh, help us understand the distinction? Yes, I guess it, uh, you know, my time I learned it really depends on who uh, you're reporting to. Uh, the pre my, my first uh, vice president of quality didn't have a hard stance. Um, during my time, quality assurance was incoming and outgoing. Um, so think customer quality, they interface directly with the customer. Um, and then supplier quality, the materials, the goods, um, approving new suppliers. And then control was everything in the middle. Um, but as I had left the company, the new vice president was doing a rebranding. So all of it is now QA. Um, they did not like control. They didn't like the allegory with police and enforcement. Um, more like we have quality. How do we keep it there? Not how do we get up to par? Interesting. Got it. And uh, yeah, just uh, love to hear some more background. You know, what was your what was your favorite part about uh, working at the Giga Factory across the different roles? Will, let's uh, let's stay with you. Um, my my favorite part was is just it, each day was truly unique. It was such a big uh, factory, um, you know, the really earning the name Giga. Um, and each problem was slightly different than the last. You were always throwing curveballs, um, always learning, always meeting new people. Um, in a very diverse environment, you know, just had so many different people um, from different colleges, backgrounds, educations, um, thought processes. You know, we had people who were engineers that didn't have engineering degrees. They had kind of grown into the engineering role. Um, and so it was just, yeah, just very unique experience, always meeting new people, learning new things. Yeah, and I'm I'm just curious to hear, you know, you said every day is uh, every day is different. Every day is a unique and surprising challenge. Can you just give a couple examples of things that like, you know, you showed up to work one day and like, oh, OK, this is what I've got to deal with today. Um, one unique part about the, the Giga factory I worked at um, is the they had to upgrade the electrical grid of the city to meet the demand of the Giga factory. And so sometimes you would come in and there was a power sag. And so you would have to turn off 
some pieces of the factory, not because you know, we weren't paying our electric bill. There just wasn't enough power at that time due to some type of high spike in demand or something like that. Um, and it was just a very unique problem to have um, where it's a battery factory. It was 24 seven. How do you work around that? Um, or, you know, like you have a really important meeting you need to get to and there's a crash on the freeway and, you know, you're, you're in like five different meetings while you're in your car parked <laughs> in the middle of the desert. Um, Oh, just very different challenges. Um, or you have a surprise meeting from some executive, you know, that you've never heard of, and you are suddenly giving tours in every process um, to this person that you've never met before, and you have no idea who they are. Um, and that's how you start your day. So, Tony, how about you? What was, uh, what were your favorite things about the job? My favorite thing is, um, you know, working together as a team. So as a kid, uh, we used to have these three-legged races where, you know, you tie two people's legs together and then you have two teams race each other, against each other. Well, working in production, it's like a three-legged race, except instead of two people, it's 2,000 people. And as you can imagine, getting, getting just two people to work together is pretty hard. When you try to coordinate so many different teams, so many different people uh, across different educational backgrounds, it's um, it's a lot of fun when it works. And when a large group like that works together, like a finely tuned machine, it is, it, it's magical. It's like harmony. Uh, and, you know, it's not just the battery factory itself, not just the operators, the engineers, but it's all the suppliers, the vendors, the customers that all also have to work together. And, you know, you're standing in process and you're looking at a conveyor belt. It's whizzing by you and you see, you know, there's a continuous line of batteries uh, coming from your machines. And you think, I made that. And it's, it's very powerful. It's very gratifying. Awesome. And then on the flip side, uh, what, were, what were the hardest parts of the job or the most challenging, uh, challenging parts of the job? Uh, let's, let's stay with Tony. Sure. Uh, probably that it, the fact that it's a three-legged race with 2,000 people. Uh, so, hey, it's great when you're winning and you're in the lead. When you're behind and you're trying to coordinate 2,000 people to go towards a common process, it can be a complete nightmare because, you know, individually, maybe you know exactly what you need to do, but the other 1,999 people, um, they have a huge part to play in this as well. And, you know, it, it can be really hectic sometimes. It can be crazy. Uh, but, you know, that's part of the fun and stress of manufacturing. Uh, yeah. And I, I think when, when you have really tough days, uh, it really manifests in two ways. One is uh, you have to turn on a dime, which is, hey, our current strategy is not working. Let's try something new. Uh, or it can result in gridlock and, you know, hey, what we're doing isn't working. Let's have everybody submit their ideas and pick the best one. So you get a lot of hurry up and wait, which can be very frustrating. Uh, also, in a manufacturing environment, there is always issues to solve, literally infinite issues. You could be the best manufacturing engineer in the world and you'll never run through uh, all the possible problems, just because that's the nature of continuous improvement. So what that means is prioritizing is hard. There's lots of moving pieces and there's information that you might not have or you may have overlooked. Uh, and you know those those problems that you overlook can often be you know some of the hardest and most impactful problems. Uh, so for me, as someone that really likes working with data, it can be tough not having all the data. Indeed. I'm, I'm just curious, when you talk about coordinating all those different functions, all those different uh, uh, people uh, doing the different uh, parts of the job, was the, how, how in practice did things get coordinated? Was it sort of a top-down command and control structure? Was there a lot of sort of intergroup connectivity where you just knew who you needed to go to to get certain things done? How, what was the sort of style of communication and coordination of effort? So practically speaking, it's almost always the latter. 
However, in you know the official hierarchy, it's always organized as a very top-down structure, kind of like a like a military hierarchy. Uh, so you know, typically you'll get goals and strategy set by the top. It flows down. Here's your contribution to the overall strategy. Uh, but in terms of defining the tactics and uh, actually implementing it, it's a lot of you know, you ask the operator next to you, you ask the engineer over there, it's figuring things out and getting it done. That's a production and engineering perspective, at least I imagine quality does not like what I just mentioned. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna jump over to that, uh, to that side of things. Again, as we alluded to uh, in some of the early, early parts of this discussion, you know, this sort of duality between uh, the production and quality teams. And Will, I know you are on the quality team. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, ostensibly, of course, everyone's aligned around the the goals as as Tony laid out around uh, manufacturing, but with these different functions. Will, I'm curious uh, in your experience, like what are some examples of when the quality and production, like specific examples of when the quality team and the production teams were at odds, and what sort of conflicts arise, and and how are those uh, things typically resolved? Yeah, thank you. And so one of my very first experiences with assembly production wasn't even direct when I had started, you know, my time, my coworker was sitting behind me. Um, and the uh, both assistant managers of assembly production were just staring down at him and said, why are you shutting down our machines? Why? What, what's the reason? When are, when are they going to be up? You know, what's wrong? And so, so for 30 minutes, they're doing this bad cop, bad cop routine on him. Um, and that was what the relationship was like with <laughs> Tony laughs. It's true. They were very aggressive because as the factory was ramping up, you know, their goal is numbers um, and quality is just trying to, you know, keep these things, the, the defects from escaping while they're, you know, hitting these ramp ups, they're skipping maintenances, et cetera. And honestly, the, the way through it is, you know, nothing exciting. It was just communication. You know, they didn't know why the machines were shut down. They didn't know what they needed to do to bring those machines back up. Um, and it wasn't really communicated well. I don't remember exactly what happened, why the machine was shut down, what, what the reason was. But the solution was when a machine was shut down, it gets a placard with a reason, what we need to turn it back on, and then the estimated time to get it back up based off like historical information. And so then we never had that issue again. It was a pain point for a long time with a very simple solution. Indeed. Yeah, it'd be interesting to just dive, double click a little bit on the ultimate incentives. You know, for these factories, there's a big pressure to get cells out the door and sell and make money. Uh, but the reality is, you know, if you have quality issues, you know, those cells are going to come back uh, on the back end as well. And how have you seen that really balanced in, as far as like the day to day within the operations of the factory? Because there is that huge incentive on you're putting billions into these factories, you know, how do you make that return and how do you balance that, that quality challenge? That's that one is interesting because the, we had a unique setup where assembly would make the defects and then formation would collect and discover the defects. And then, you know, the, my quality team would determine, is this in spec? Is this out of spec? Is there something we can do to bring it in spec? Um, or is there some way we can adopt the material so that we can say it's okay if it's an internal spec? You know, external specs are like, no go, it's trash, get rid of it. Um, and so assembly would just be 24 seven producing and we would discover defects days later while they're sitting in the warehouse getting inspected. So we did have like a warehouse of material that we could go through. Um, and What's nice is the first goal wasn't profitability. The company and executives knew we were not going to make money for like the first five years. Um, so we did have some leeway in saying like, yep, it's trash, get rid of it. They just wanted to make sure that assembly could produce. Um, and then the focus was on defects. So we did have a lot of time to get our processes and methods under control without like the financial pressure at first. Um, they did come back, you know, with a with a magnifying glass, but at first we did have a lot of leeway to um, get rid of defects. Interesting, and yeah. I think that's a key point just on that. The fact that they expected it to take years is I think uh, something that's forgotten a lot in the market today. We hear a lot of very unrealistic expectations uh, right now on how fast people think they could spin up and ensure gets a high quality and high yield uh, from these factories. Exactly. Yeah. So when you hear companies announce that, you know, they'll uh, 
we hear often, you know, we'll spend one year building the factory, getting all the equipment in, and then another year bring it up to full production. You know, let's let's just keep in mind that uh, the factory that's you know kind of started off this whole trend and is held up as the example of of best in class it took four to five years to get to that point. So <clears throat> that's just something to keep in mind when you hear these uh, these project these very optimistic projections around taking a year or two to ramp up to full full gigascale production. Um, Interesting. So um, just hypothetically, uh, not saying this ever happened, we've heard, uh, you know, we've heard stories of things like, uh, you know, uh, in practice, kind of crazy stuff going on. Like, for example, uh, scissors getting dropped into a mixer uh, of electrode material. So when something like that happens, it's just sort of like a, you know, something completely out of left field. What happens? How is that kind of how is that kind of thing? Uh, addressed or resolved. Tony, you have any comments on that since we're on the production team? Yeah, as you can imagine, uh, you know, having some scissors in your your EV, it would be a very bad thing. Uh, that's, a, that's a safety hazard and who else knows what would happen. So there's really only one legitimate response to this. You have to flush everything out and you scrap it all. And if you don't have definitive proof of when it happened, where it happened, which equipment it's isolated to, then that means that everything that's questionable uh, has to be scrapped. And, you know, if you're doing a maintenance program where you only check that electrode mixer, you know, once a week, uh, I guess that means everything you produce since the last good maintenance check uh, is going in the dumpster because uh, that's just a, not a risk that you're willing to take having metallic shavings get into your battery because it can cause a, a short. And I want to point out that metal contamination is actually a very serious safety problem. Uh, you know, in this case, it's scissors, but there's a lot of other process steps that can cause uh, shavings, burrs, uh, all sorts of contaminants getting into the battery. And another thing to consider is, in addition to the scrap, you also have to question if, you know, it, does it damage the equipment? Does it affect future production runs? So let's say you send a technician in there to clean out the remnants of the scissors. Well, who knows what other microscopic particles are still in there? Uh, does someone wiping it with, you know, a, a alcohol wipe and uh, some gloves actually remove all the contaminants. So you have to do a lot of analyses to understand if uh, the defect condition has been removed. And these are all questions that actually require uh, significant analysis. So, you know, look at it under a microscope, look at the electrochemical data and do root cause analysis for uh, one, did we remove the defect condition? But also two, probably more interestingly is, you know, how does a pair of scissors end up in the mixer in the first place? Uh, always interesting answers to that one. Uh, from my experience, it tends to be, uh, you know, maintenance technicians leaving their tools, forgetting something. I mean, it happens. And when it happens, it's especially bad in batteries. Indeed. So that, that, you know, it seems to be a fairly obvious one. If a pair of scissors gets uh, chopped up in a little bits and makes its way into batteries, you're going to have a real problem. But, you know, our understanding is that the scrap issue can is can actually sometimes have a lot more nuance to it. And it can really be not so much of a judgment call, but just kind of a gray area as to whether uh, whether a batch of material or a batch of batteries needs needs to be scrapped. Um, I wonder, uh, perhaps, Will, can you speak to any kind of examples where it's a little bit more of a a gray area, not not so obvious uh, what to do and, and how that determination is made? Yes. And yes, quality, you know, in a perfect world, we have a spec for everything under the sun. You're like, okay, what do I do in this situation? You look at this manual or drawing or disposition guide, um, and it'll say between these two criteria or outside this criteria is bad. Um, you know, Paul was mentioning, you know, like the expectation the first few years, you won't be making money, you're just ramping up, you can just throw stuff away. 
Well, after that five years is up and now you're profitable and they're starting to look at those buckets that are eating into your profit. And the first thing that comes up is defects. Um, the first one that came up was metal contamination. Um, we had traced it to a supplier. You know, we went through their processes, saw what they were doing. Um, they were very protective of their lines and their operators and their operation. So we had to schedule tours ahead of time. So we always had this inkling that they were cleaning and doing things before we would arrive. And they would only ever show us their best performing line. They knew which one was the best. Um, and after many studies, you know, many defects we had found, you know, like, Hey, this contamination is coming from you. It's, you know, this range of sizes. Um, a lot of the conveyors are magnetic to keep the can and the cell in place. So the iron contamination can never fully come out. Um, and for a long time, we just instituted a stricter test at the end of formation to catch this metal contamination, but it ballooned to a massive defect rate. Um, you know, eventually we came to the customer and said, hey, we have this issue. We're working it out with our supplier. We know what it is. We have a plan to get rid of it. This is the yield we're looking for. We need a little bit of relief in this one specific area. Does this measurement really matter? Um, and they said, we can accept down to this limit. And then our lines will take the hit on, on this because we want more batteries. <laughs> um, and so we were able to get that spec relief. I believe it's still into this day. Um, so it was like a win-win for my company because we were able to fix the contamination on the supplier side and still kept the spec relief on the customer side. Um, so it was actually a very nice uh, re resolution there. But for a long time, it was just like, yeah, what do we do with these batteries? We know they're not going to meet our customer spec. So we're going to hold on to them until they do meet spec or we can ask them to relieve the spec. Excellent. Yeah. And it's really, it's interesting. So for those in the audience who've been following along, you know, we've been doing this webinar series on battery manufacturing going back some months now, we're going to continue it. Um, but there are a couple of themes that, uh, that come up that I think are really interesting that have sort of followed us along <clears throat> through this ongoing uh, dialogue we've had about battery manufacturing. And so one of them, um, when we, we, a couple months back, we did a webinar on what the battery industry can learn from the semiconductor uh, sector in terms of, you know, that the semiconductors rapid ramp up uh, in terms of scale and quality. And one of the major lessons was uh, really just digging deep on your supply chain and um, and going going deep into your suppliers' operations to ensure quality of materials and and processes and practices before things hit the loading dock of of your battery factory. So that's one very, you know, Will just gave a a vivid illustration of that. <clears throat> and then another in, very interesting thing that I just heard is you had this supplier quality issue that was causing metal particulate contamination and the way that you were checking it was at the very end of the process by looking at formation, right? And so, you know, a lot of our audience is is familiar with this, but you know, Tony showed how there's three different factories. There's the electrode production, then there's the cell uh, assembly, and then finally you have the um, the formation and, and finishing and, and quality checking. So it was literally like an issue with incoming materials, and then the control was all the way at the very end of that process, looking at uh, um, looking at formation to catch it. Um, so I think that's really uh, that's really fascinating. Um, I'd love to go back to Tony. You alluded uh, early on to <clears throat> how uh, sometimes uh, the problems are, you know, insidious or really obvious, but often overlooked, and how data can help you uh, help you identify and address those things. Uh, I wonder if you could share some examples of, you know, uh, how a problem that manifested in one way, and you know how you ultimately uh, found the solution was something obvious but overlooked. Anything come to mind? Sure. So in general, there's exciting problems and then there's boring problems. People are focused on the exciting problems just because, you know, they're sexy. So that means everybody's looking at your slurry and, you know, the rheology and, you know, the thickness of the coating and, you know, that's the fun stuff to look at. Then there's a bunch of really boring problems that no engineer wants to work on. Probably probably myself included. So uh, these problems include things that are not prestigious. So things like ovens and, you know, cleaning. Uh, I don't think any engineer graduates and thinks, hey, I want to be a janitor at the local factory. 
Uh, but actually, this is where a lot of the problems come from. Uh, so we mentioned earlier metal contamination. And all throughout the battery manufacturing process, you have um, you know, films being slit, uh, rolls being cut. Uh, there is just tons of opportunities for burrs and uh, particles to be formed. So specifically, uh, I worked at a factory where you know, we had tons of winders. These winders would you know, cut the electrode and wind it up. And obviously everyone focuses on the winding because, hey, it's a winder, we should, that's its primary function. But really uh, a, a very tangential uh, function capability of this machine was that it would cut the substrate. And if the blade was not, uh, sufficiently sharp, and obviously a blade is going to wear over time, then it would generate um, you know, particles. And these particles are so small that you literally cannot see it with your naked eye. What you need to do is turn off all the lights and shine a flashlight on uh, you know, where it would fall, and then you would see like really faint glints of metal. It's kind of like uh, panning for gold. So because it was really hard to see, and because no one's thinking about it, then this problem could basically occur and reoccur for weeks, even months. And then you would basically get tiny little copper particles being wound into your jelly roll and then making it to formation. And then it's gonna fail formation because you have a bunch of copper in your jelly roll. Uh, so, uh, you know, cleanliness is not, exciting, but it's super, super important. And the way we uh, resolved this issue was basically to have a team go around, inspect each winder. And if it had problems, they would wipe it down. And that's all it took to solve a multi-million dollar problem. Uh, yeah. And you know, you could run one subset of winders that have no cleaning, and then another subset of wonders that do go through this cleaning protocol. And based on that, you can calculate, you know, the amount of money that you're losing through defects. And, you know, it's super straightforward to calculate an ROI from there and understand what the actual impact of cleanliness is on the process. Excellent. And I'm just going to opportunistically weave in a, a question or a comment from the audience. So, um, and you can tell me whether you have any experience uh, directly to this question, but you brought up the issue of metal uh, metal shavings. You know, we've been talking about that for a few minutes. Um, so it, uh, the, the question asks, we've seen that some manufacturers are still using steel doctor blades to clean calendar rolls. Is uh, is this an issue or a non-issue in your experience, if you, if you have any uh, experience on that? Yeah. Uh, so in general, I've only worked with steel doctor blades. I haven't really had much experience with any alternatives. And what we found was that it's excellent up to a certain point. After that, it's good for another duration, uh, you know, measured in uh, meters of material that you're cutting or slitting. Uh, after that, you know, you get so much deformation that you're not really cutting anymore. You're more crushing and deforming. Uh, and Obviously, the duration of that blade is going to vary and depend on the actual you know, material that you're producing uh, based on the additives, the chemistry, the, and whatnot. So what that means is you can't just say, hey, the manufacturer recommends I replace this every you know, 1 million meters, so you know, I'll do that. But you actually have to do an analysis to see how uh, your material impacts that blade, and if you need to replace it sooner or later, or even if it's not a you know a, a good material for your blade, and you should use something else. Excellent, awesome. Yeah, and I think expounding on that a little bit, just I think when people think about you know, you know, everyone assumes that this is a copy paste uh, sort of technology where you're taking stuff from one factory to another those subtle variations of what Tony brought up, you know, if you have a slightly different uh, slurry, if you have some different particles in there with different hardness, that's going to affect the wear and tear, the, 
you know, different, you know, you have a new cell design that's a little thinner to get higher power out of the electrodes, you know, that's going to affect the winders and how that all comes together. And so all those different components, you actually have to figure those out and how it's going to work within your individual factory. And then from there, you know, it's, you're dependent on your suppliers too. And putting together those pieces and libraries and learnings is really important uh, for every new factory and every process change or material change that you put into that factory. Indeed. <clears throat> um, so I've got a, a question for Will. So, uh, you know, you mentioned that you worked in the, on the formation quality team, which is obviously, uh, you know, what, it's toward the very end of the process and where a lot of these issues are caught. I wonder if you could speak just generally about uh, what were the, you know, whether the sort of grading criteria or pass, pass, fail, you know, not, not betraying anything like super secret or proprietary, but generally speaking, uh, when these cells are all going through formation and your team is looking, uh, looking at the, uh, the formation data. And again, for our audience, formation is just at the very end of the uh, manufacturing process, every single cell that's manufactured is charged and discharged under very carefully controlled conditions to lock in the inner structure of the battery. Uh, those uh, protocols are typically very um, proprietary, but nonetheless, they produce data that is used for the quality um, for the quality function. So Will, I wonder if you could speak to what are the kinds of things that a quality team looks for in formation in order to ter determine um, basically if those cells can ship or not. Yes, yeah. So I mean, for everyone, you know, maybe not is familiar with manufacturing is the, the line has its upper and lower specs. Think things like voltage, internal resistance, capacity. Um, those get kicked out, right? So towards the end of my tenure, we started playing with um, sigma values of our defects. So like you have your normal range of defects that are just outside your specs um, where you're like, okay, they're just not up to par. They're probably safe. They're just not interesting. We're going to send those to Redwood, you know, the recycling the new recycling facility um but then you had these defects that were super large outliers you know above and below we started opening those cells when we had more time to look at these because it wasn't something that you know as tony had mentioned it's a top-down structure um you know the goals would get more specific as they work their way down the chain there was no goal to say like what are these defects but but our uh, technical assistance had a big in, uh, interest in these defects because these are the ones that could slip or could show you a very key problem in your process. And we were also getting batteries from our customer that were failing at the end consumer. So we got to see what was happening past our customer to see what those defects looked like and then connect them back to our process. One thing we kept seeing was when something showed a really low capacity, there'd be a large U-shape missing in the cathode. It would just be gone and just be completely ripped out. Um, and it would happen maybe once a week. I mean, we were making, you know, tens of millions of batteries a week. So it's the odds are you're gonna find another one. Um, and then they're kicking out, so that's good. Um, but how are they making it through the process in the past? Um, and then where are they coming from and how do they fix it? You're, you're probably thinking, well, it's, if it's only happening once a week, why would you go chase it? You know, it's not hitting your bottom line. Um, the, the bigger issue we saw was when we have these large outlier defects, they, there's a symptom somewhere in your process and it's impossible to know if it's going to get worse or, or get better on its own. And these bigger defects are things that it could be a symptom, like I said, of something much worse. And the only way to know is to go open them. Um, a, Another one is really high internal resistance. Um, we relied on the, the innards of the cell, the, you know, the role of your material contacting the can for a good connection, a good res internal resistance. And a high IR typically meant a tab wasn't welded properly, uh, the, the innards weren't making enough contact, something really rudimentary, but sometimes, sometimes you'd be missing a tab. Sometimes you'd have really weird process defects and you're probably thinking, how did it get from assembly to formation without a tab. What, what failed in our process to get here? Because there's a check for that. So those are the kinds of things we were looking for. What's bypassing our checks upstream? Because um, again, it, it could get worse, um, we've seen it. And so looking at the weird outliers, you know, the, the, the extreme outliers um, was where my, my team would step in, hold the material, make sure it's not um, more prolific than we think, and then determine if it was, we would extract the cell from the defect part of the lot um, and then say yay or nay at the uh, end of the week. 
Interesting. Um, I yeah, want to sort of stay on that theme a little bit of again on 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 the quality. And I know each of you were there sort of during different phases of uh, of the the Gigafactory's life cycle. But I, I'm curious. Uh, maybe I'll ask. Start with Tony. Um, you know, there's sort of two. You you could sort of break it down into two phases, right? One is where you're ramping up the factory to production. You're dialing things in. You're increasing throughput and and sort of dialing in your specs. And then at some point you get to you know steady state. And I know you know I, I, um, my understanding that 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 was only achieved fairly recently. But I, um, I'm wondering uh, how much in each of your experience. But we'll start with Tony. Uh, was, you know, the the exercise of of bringing up the factory to like full production and quality versus once it's there, I guess how much, I, I really my question is once a factory is at full production, what's the sort of split between just maintaining things within that spec versus seeking to constantly improve and eke out another, you know, couple tenths of a percent of yield uh because you know once you're once you're above a certain yield every additional little incremental improvement in yield can dramatically affect the profitability of the factory so uh tony do you have any uh, observations on that yeah uh there's there's going to be competing forces within a factory uh so you're going to have a group of people and it's going to be fairly large that say hey we have a golden goose just let it keep laying eggs. Why would you mess with it? And I think that's a perfectly valid argument. Uh, but you also have another group that is going to say, hey, maybe you can make it lay eggs faster. And I think a lot of, uh, you know, does it make sense to just run at steady state versus trying to uh, optimize the process depends on what is the uh, marginal or incremental uh, you know, benefit for some given cost. So, you know, if we require spending $1 trillion to, you know, run our machines, you know, one second faster or 1% faster, uh, does that really make sense? I would argue no. Uh, but on the other hand, if you can achieve 10% defect reduction by basically having people go around some janitors and you know, wipe your blades. Uh, obviously, that is a huge improvement for very little cost. And I think the key to answering these types of questions is to have data about your process. So what you'll find at just about every single factory, and not just battery factories, but I'm talking literally any factory, is you have these PLCs collecting gigabytes, terabytes of data, tons of data. So much data that no one can actually like manually look at it. Really, the only time anyone looks at process data is when something goes wrong, and then it's like, oh my God, I have two years of data to look at. And you know, all these data quality issues because no one's looked at it in two years. You would take that data and you would try to make some sort of engineering argument to say, uh, yeah, if we do this experiment. We expect to see X benefit for Y cost. And you know, if you have that kind of data and that kind of analysis, then it makes it really easy to calculate an ROI on, yes, we should definitely squeeze that goose harder uh, versus, you know, let's just let's just coast and enjoy free eggs. Excellent. Yeah, I'd love to hear from Will. You know, what was your experience of that sort of potential? you know, duality dichotomy between just keeping things within spec versus looking for incremental improvements as you go along. Yeah, it, it, that, that one was definitely hard for me um, because there was, you know, we did have some time to look at, you know, these, these incremental improvements, but by the end of my time, you know, the ramp up was done there were a lot of defect projects going on. We were, you know, on the Pareto chart, we were hitting the top three issues based off time and resources and cost. Um, and so the incremental improvements were things like very process related, not necessarily defect related. Um, think things like we need an extra signature when we defect something. We need an extra call before we disposition this material. This person needs to be informed when you do this. Um, there was 
you know, unrelated to the process, actually, you know, uh, here at our, you know, at our company, you know, a big thing is security, cybersecurity. And it was something that was ramping up as I had left my, my company. Um, and so like flash drives were encrypted after, you know, like they had a little code on them that would like, you had to enter the code and then return the flash drive and the code would change. You know, there was incremental improvements at all pieces, you know, um, of the factory, hiring, recruiting, um, training, uh, uh, like maintenance, um, they got some more, they got like a longer training period. They offered some classes at the local community college for them to get better certified. Um, a lot of outside the process improvements as well, like on the people side, um, to bring up, you know, education, tooling, um, things like that. Um, once the defects and, uh, the actual ramp up was done. Um, and so it, I think it really all came together um, towards uh, the end of uh, my time there. And I think in, in general, and I see some questions from the audience on, you know, how long it takes to introduce new processes and that golden goose challenge is, is really real outside of the continuous improvements and hitting the, the top uh, areas in the Pareto charts. Um, you know, one of our advisors described, you know, working uh, gigafactory is an unstable equilibrium. There's always stuff trying to push you off the edges. So you're trying to keep in that, that steady state range as long as you can. And especially major changes, whether it's, you know, new equipment or, you know, things that are outside that haven't really been qualified to a larger degree. Uh, it's, it's hard to make those arguments outside of you know, the, even to make an argument around data-driven uh, argument around, you know, cleaning pieces of equipment uh, to get rid of metal scrap, you know, takes information and data and, you know, you have to motivate that. Uh, the new equipment and larger changes, uh, it is hard to, to implement those just given that uh, the challenge of keeping that equilibrium stable and continuing to produce at high quality at high uh, volumes. Interesting. Um I, I want to uh, turn to another question from our audience, and it, it echoes of something that uh, Will mentioned before. You made a passing reference to internal specs versus ex external specs. Uh, it was when we were talking about, you know, nuanced decisions around scrap. Uh, but the sort of internal versus external implies, you know, obviously the Gigafactory uh, had a very <laughs> lar large and important customer um, that, you know, with some functions co-located, uh, you know, even in the same facility. And I'm wondering, you know, in each of your experience, and we can start with Will, uh, what was your experience of kind of managing uh, things around kind of the proprietary information of the internal workings of, you know, the, the company that you worked at versus uh, what was shared uh, with uh, with the customer? And, you know, any kind of examples of of, of times where, where, uh, where that divide had to be kept clearly in mind? Yeah, th this one's this one's an interesting question. So there's some ex internal specs that are very obvious to the customer. Like we had uh, a barcode on every single battery. Um, if the barcode was not readable by our machines, it would kick out. But the customer did not use the barcode. They didn't care about it. Um, they had a digital tracking of every battery on their lines. So when a battery would kick out, you know, it would it knew based off position. Um, so that was an easy one, you know, they, they could scan it. It's just, a, it was just a QR code. Um, but there was, there was a time where we needed something from them and I forget what it was exactly. Um, I think it was some information or maybe use of one of their labs. Cause they had some equipment we did not, um, we didn't have room for it. Um, and their response was, we want this drawing. And we said, no. <laughs> and so we had to go with without the ask that we gave to them, we had to find another means to get the task completed. And they took a hard stance. It was, it was very often that they would throw bargaining chips at us and say, hey, if you want this from us, you need to give us this. Um, and we've seen it before with the customer where they get a drawing and then they start doing things themselves on some items. Um, and so it was often where uh, we couldn't share that data, but they have shared like their in-field charging data and we share our testing data with them so there are some things where you know there is a, a give and take um but that's exactly what it is, is a give and take there was no free anything between either um other than the bigger asks from like their executives this is at like the engineer manager level this isn't um things like hey i want you to build a new line or hey i need more batteries from you this is more like 
can we use your equipment? Hey, can we get like some information on how this set of material did on your lines? You know, we're seeing something weird on our end or something like that. Tony, any, anything to come to mind for you in terms of uh, working with uh, working with the customer and what kind of information you can share and what you can't? Well, I'm going to be transparent and say I'm not a quality guy. So, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, say that, you know, there's the spec sheet that says capacity is between this and this, internal resistance is between this and this, and, you know, typically some pretty safe parameters. I think internally, uh, what we do is we look at many other uh, parameters, metrics, that we don't then share with a customer, mostly because you know it's difficult to interpret it. So let me give an example. There are certain metrics that you know everybody calculated calculates it their own uh, unique way. Things like uh, you know internal resistance. Uh, depending on how you choose to measure it, uh, you can get wildly different results. So if you're expecting one milli ohm. And if you just give that number to a customer, they're going to say, hey, your spec sheet says, you know, 16 milli ohms. Well, what's the difference? Uh, so you'll, you'll see a lot of metrics like that where it makes sense to use it for internal quality control purposes. So things like self-discharge, um, you know, decrease in voltage between two time periods, uh, capacity between certain voltages. These are useful for troubleshooting and diagnosing things that occurred in electrode or assembly. But if you send that to a customer, you know, there's no context to it and it will often just scare them. So that's why um, you often see the phenomenon of internal versus external specs. And it's not because we're hiding something, it's more that it requires a lot of context to be able to properly interpret it. Awesome. And we've got so many terrific questions from the audience, but we are coming to the end of our hour. I just want to uh, throw one more question out there, kind of zooming out high level. Um, you know, so the transition to electrification and electric vehicles obviously is, uh, is a really important component of the energy transition and uh, energy sustainability. And I'm just curious for each of you, how much did you find that uh, as a, a personally as a part of your motivation in working, you know, at the Gigafactory and continuing your work in in the battery space? And what was your observation of the people around you, you know, versus you know just kind of working in cool technology or it's just a job or you know how did how did those uh, kind of motivations stack up um, for each of you and the folks that you worked with? Will I can start with you? Yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll be fully transparent on this one. Uh, where I am and where I worked was very motivated by financial pressure at the time. Um, but the mission, you know, as the company called it, I worked at and, you know, what you're working towards, obviously the goal of the factory is to make money, like Tony showed in his presentation, but it was nice knowing that we are contributing to a more green and electrified future. Um, and it it made the decisions you were making behind the scenes have more weight, in my opinion. Um, you know, this is maybe might be a weird um, analogy, but I had just watched the documentary about Jewel, who thought they were taking down the tobacco industry, and then they got bought out by Marlboro. You know, and so a lot of the workers were like, "This isn't what I signed up for." You know, and I probably would have felt the same if you know the whole time the mission was we want to be green, we want to electrify the future. Um, and then all of a sudden we do a venture, you know, with like fossil fuels or something. Um, but it, it definitely helped. And, you know, definitely here where I'm at, you know, at Voltaic, it's nice knowing that we can have a hand in electrifying the future um, and go to a more green um, environmental impact. Uh, but at the time, unfortunately, I didn't have enough experience in my career where I could just choose to go where I wanted. Um, but now that I do, I, I like where I am. Awesome. Tony, how about you just for in your own experience and what you've observed the folks you you've worked with during your time in battery manufacturing? Yeah, so, you know, I'm a battery nerd. I, I love batteries, so a bit of an unfair question, but you know, I'm also a gardener and it's 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 currently December 19th and I have tomatoes growing in my backyard. Uh, you know, I feel like working in this industry is a good way to be able to 
make some contribution to the challenges facing the world. Uh, and I think, you know, at some level, almost everyone working in this industry is interested in either uh, combating climate change or working with really cool cars. And yeah, it's it's fun all around. Awesome. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, thanks to the audience for uh, for all these great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. And please stay tuned. Uh, you know, you can check out our LinkedIn page and other uh, channels for announcements of forthcoming webinars. We'll be doing one uh, again towards the end of January. We'll have uh, some news out on that soon. So please stay tuned. And thanks again for joining us this past hour. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everybody. And thanks. Happy everybody. holidays, everyone.